Hi, welcome into another edition of Lunch Hour Live. I'm Sue O'Connell. You know, the world is continuing to spin and we are looking at global temperatures that are on the rise. And scientists are wondering if we need solutions beyond just reducing carbon emissions. Enter geoengineering from just sucking the carbon right out of the air to physically blocking out sunlight. The options, they may seem a little far-fetched, but as time is running out on conventional solutions to climate change, lots of scientists are asking the hard questions. Can geoengineering really work? Well, NOVA answers this question and more in the latest program, Can We Cool the Planet? It's a documentary examining technologies that could help us combat the looming threat of climate change. The climate problem is more than just reducing climate emissions. It's what we do with all those emissions we've already accumulated. Here's a look at what could happen if we don't address it soon. The easiest thing, believe it or not, is to burn less carbon, right? To, to not generate the CO2 in the first place. Carbon-free energy, like wind, solar, and nuclear power, can drive down most of our annual emissions. And the rest could be offset with negative emissions technologies that remove CO2 from the air. We will do it. We will get to the day with our big global celebrations. We get to net zero day, where we brought human CO2 emissions to zero. I think it'll happen in my lifetime. It is doable. But on that day, we have not solved the climate problem. All we've done is stop making it worse. The problem that remains is heat. The temperature of the Earth is determined by heat coming in from the sun and heat going out by radiation out to space. Every single day, CO2 from our past emissions traps energy in the Earth's system the same amount of energy as 500,000 of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, detonating at once. That heat is altering our climate. What's it going to be like when, you know, three months of the year are 115 degrees? When vast ecosystems have died out? People are going to push for, for doing something about this. And many fear Earth is approaching a tipping point that will trigger rapid change. The uncertainties that keep me up at night are, what if we aren't doing enough and there's some monster lurking behind the door that all of a sudden comes out into the world among us? It's a good idea that humanity has some sort of a backstop technology, something to do if we get surprised in a way that is very, very dangerous. I can't uh, urge you enough to watch this. I watched it this morning. What tremendous storytelling and visual explanation. And here today to give us a behind the scenes look at creating this film, I'm joined by NOVA producer Caitlin Sachs. And can we cool the planet filmmakers Ben Kalina and Jen Schneider? Welcome to Lunch Hour Live. Letting the folks at home know that if you have a question, you can just give it to us in the comments and we'll try to get it on the air. Congratulations on such a tremendous project to the three of you. It's, it was really quite compelling. Caitlin, um, you know, Nova's done a lot of films about the threat of climate change, but um, I'm, I'm not thinking that there have been many about climate change solutions. Um, What's up with this pivot now? Why wasn't it done sooner? And is there enough robust science now to talk about solutions? Yeah, NOVA's been uh, covering climate change really for decades, um, both, both um, if, frankly, before people even called it climate change back when it was global warming, um, both how it's caused, that we know that it is primarily human caused, um, and a little bit about the solutions. We have had a few films that have covered some solutions. Um, but uh, right now, I mean, I think just recently, a, a study came out from the Yale Climate Communications um, uh, uh, Center 
uh, saying that people really want more climate reporting. And also there's been a lot of um, research into how we need more solutions journalis journalism because um, understanding uh, that there are some solutions uh, helps avoid uh, this feeling of defeatism. Um, and so NOVA, I, I would say um, we're making a concerted effort now uh, to try to to try to move the conversation a little bit further in the direction of what can we do about this? Most people in our country now believe that climate change is happening um, and, the, and, and, and that it's human caused. Um, so really where the conversation needs to be is not is it happening, but what are we going to do about it? And so we have a number of them, um, lined up that are, are, are tackling it from different angles. Right. Ben and Jen, I got to tell you, whenever um, I am even just about to watch the documentary or a documentary, I get fearful that I'm not going to be able to understand it. I'm happy to say I understood all of this. You guys aren't scientists. Um, how do you go about creating an engaging uh, and digestible storyline that still is true to the science and tells the information and communicates the information in a way that someone like me can actually understand it? It's a, a great question. question. <laughs> uh, that's a question we kept asking and trying to answer throughout the whole process. Um, I mean, I think that the first thing that we have to do is figure out what is the connection between the science and to the problem and a problem that we can, the average person can identify, like the sort of everyday problems that you might start to see um, if we don't, you know, curb our emissions, but also the, the problems that we may continue to see, even if we continue to draw down to zero. I think that when you make those connections and kind of frame the questions in terms that people can access, then the science becomes clearer. So for us, that was, all right, we have too much CO2. How can we remove CO2? Okay, these technologies are aimed at trying to bring some of that CO2 down. How does that work? So that's kind of the entry point. Ben, one of the most striking numbers in the film is that humans produce about 36 metric gigatons with a G of carbon emissions a year. Um, when you were talking about how to convey that, uh, what were you looking at to be able to say this is what 37 gigatons of carbon emissions looks like? Yeah, that's, that was a really big question for us, right? Because we, we settled ultimately on this idea of comparing it to the National Mall in BC. Uh, one of our one of the folks we talked to at first also described it as um, you know, compared it to the size of Olympic swimming pools. Uh, and, you know, there's there's all these different ways that you can think about it. But um, ultimately, you know, I think it's it's really hard. And one of the, the challenges with CO2 is that it's invisible. Uh, you know, most people, you know, it's, it's all around us, but it's invisible. So how do you make that concrete? And so, you know, ultimately we came up with something that was a way of boiling it down to something that's a little more uh, recognizable which is, you know, essentially coal um, and a scale of coal uh, and a scale that relates to, uh, you know, or, or at least the, the visual of coal. That's something that people do recognize. And, um, you know, it's in the news a lot. So that that allowed us to play with the National Monument and start to build that framework for people so that we could have this object in the sky that we could come back to over and over again. Um, so that as we introduce each of these different technologies, we can really bring it back to that large block that represents what we emit each year, because that's really what we're working against here. Uh, not you just- Lunch Hour Live, if you've got a question for our guests, uh, please leave it in the comments section and we'll bring it to them. And um, you know, the thing about the documentary too, is it seems like there's two parts to it. You've got the, the first half, which is offering several ways to reduce our yearly output of carbon emissions. And then the second half, I guess, is where we really um, start being challenged to ask ourselves about what we need to do with all of this carbon emission that we have created. And I say we, I mean humans, uh, over the past 200 years um, that's contributing to the obvious rise of global temperatures. So the film explores many methods of the cooling of the planet, like shooting uh, salt into clouds, um, creating a sun barrier in the atmosphere, and one method uh, that uses something a little bit greener, and that's trees. Let's take a look at the clip. 
outside of urban and agricultural areas, there's room for about 2.5 billion acres of forest. The area we identified equals the size of the United States. So there's a huge area available for restoration. Enough space for 1.2 trillion new trees, all sucking CO2 out of the air. If we were to restore a trillion trees, the right types of trees in the right kinds of soils, and have them grow to full health, they could store an additional 205 gigatons of carbon. To put that into context, we've released nearly 660 gigatons of carbon into Earth's systems since human industrial activity began. Restoring global forests and conserving the vital forests that we currently have could take a huge chunk out of that excess carbon. This is a really massive carbon drawdown solution. And we knew that this was going to make an enormous splash. But these findings also made waves. That study is causing a lot of debate. On the one hand, a lot of people are talking about the potential of restoration of force. On the other hand, I would say um, <laughs> a lot of people are very upset about it. The uncertainty around the amount of carbon that's stored in trees is so high that we can't really make any informed recommendations on how many trees we need to plant. Lola wants to use new technology from NASA to fill those areas of uncertainty with hard data. You know, I'm old enough to uh, predate Arbor Day, uh, so I know that trees have always been an important conversation when it comes to the planet. And I'm wondering of all the ways that uh, you've suggested and scientists have suggested uh, to cool the planet that are in the film, is there one that you found most interesting or most compelling? Jen, we'll start with you. Well, I think one message that, um, we hoped would be very clear is that there is no one solution that is going to be sort of a silver bullet for this. So, um, you know, at the same time, we want to maintain the sort of optimism and the potential of all of these solutions. So, um, you know, those technologies that are able to pull CO2 straight out of the air and then other technologies that marry with that to just bury it straight underground is, so exciting and feels like, oh, problem solved, great. Um, but unfortunately, you know, these things are still in their infancy and there's a big question of affordability and scale. And so then the film pivots to look at other things and other things. And as you get further and further down the road, you realize we're gonna really need it all. Um, and we're gonna need to invest resources and research for a whole toolkit of solutions. You know, that was actually, I had that reaction watching the film several times, well, well, there it is, there's the answer. Yeah. Then, well, well, maybe that's not the only answer. We have a, a question from uh, someone on social media just wondering, is there an estimated cost for cooling the planet? Do is are, are there numbers that are thrown around? I mean, obviously there are costs that just aren't about money and about uh, how much we may or may not save. But in terms of an economic snapshot, does, does someone have a figure for that? Well, I, I, I have not heard a figure like that. Um, that's one of the challenges with this is that so many of these ideas come from so many different parts of the spectrum, whether it's a nature-based solution or a scaled up industrial process like direct air capture. Um, I'm sure you could try to come up with a number like that, but I think it's also why something like solar geoengineering or ScopeX, which the ScopeX project, which we feature in the film, why that gets so much attention is because um, you know, if you're looking for a, an idea that on a very basic level uh, is designed to literally cool the planet um, and one where you could assign some sort of a price tag to it, that this is probably the one that at least has been suggested as having the most digestible, quick and, you know, quote unquote, affordable um, price tag. And we've heard numbers in the, 
you know, mid five to $10 billion a year on a project uh, that was global in scale, where you would send a fleet of airplanes up into the stratosphere uh, to reflect sunlight away from the earth. And that, so that, I think, you know, Jen, maybe you have a different um, take on it, but as far as numbers for cooling the planet, that's the one that sticks out. Um, Caitlin, last time we spoke, you had just kind of gotten back from the Antarctic, uh, and I'm wondering, um, and it was uh, in, in, in the before times, as we're referring to it, I think you were actually on your way to a cocktail party, uh, so uh, that seems like a billion years ago. But I'm wondering if your, your perspective of, um, it was a work cocktail party, just so we're clear, uh, and I'm just wondering if the, your, your perspective of having been at, the, at, 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 the, at an extreme part of the world and then working on this uh if what what your feelings are about about it you know i mean it's one thing for me to be sitting in my dining room worrying about climate change but it's another to be out in the world experiencing it uh, how do you feel that's uh uh that's a really interesting question and i think it's one of the challenges that uh we have with communicating climate change is that um it is not something that very many people experience on a day to day basis. Now that's actually starting to change a little bit. Um, we've, we're seeing it with uh, the fires out west, we're seeing it with um, flooding and more intense storms that people are actually starting to viscerally feel it where they are. But one of the challenges and one of one of the barriers to action is that it, it, it feels like climate change is going to affect somebody else, um, but not me. And there's actually scientific data to back up this psychological phenomenon. Um, so I'd say that, um, first of all, in Antarctica, it was extremely cold and I like, I did not feel, I, I, I did not feel like the climate was changing while, while it was there. But I do think what we're going to start to see and the reason why this film is so important right now is that we're gonna start to see more and more people feeling the effects of climate change and people are going to want solutions fast solutions that um, that go beyond just reducing emissions. Because I think, and this is my opinion, I think the world is going to realize that there are already consequences that we really don't like. And that's where the conversation is going to move. Okay, what can we do about this absolutely huge disaster? That's when things like geoengineering, which right now are extremely controversial, extremely political, that's when people are actually gonna start talking about them seriously. Um, and, uh, and 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 so the, the public needs to be informed on what these technologies actually are and what their consequences and costs are as well. Jen and Ben, when I was, I'm going to keep talking about me growing up. Um, when I was growing up, when I'd be watching a film uh, with scientists on it, um, they were almost always completely male and completely white. And the idea that I, I mean, I know I couldn't, but the idea that I might want to dream someday to be a scientist, because apparently there's math involved and I don't want to do that. But your film really works uh, very hard to make sure you're highlighting the work of people who, who have been doing the work, uh, women and people of color and, and young business people. Um, you know, that was a thoughtful choice on your your behalf. And I know those people have been there and have been working, but it's great to see them getting the attention that they deserve. Yeah, I think that um, that was really important to both Ben and I, uh, as well as Caitlin and everyone at NOVA. And so um, fortunately, um, you know, it, we didn't have to go uh, looking under rocks <laughs> to find a whole fleet, uh, a whole generation of people who are really engaged in this topic. I think because climate change you know, as we've all heard in the the sort of public conversation, is is a topic that really um, concerns millennials and people who are going to inherit the consequences of what we're doing right now. And so, I think that um, you know, it was exciting for us as well to see how many women and scientists of color um, and young scientists are really um, very engaged in this in this work. And Ben, the business aspect of it to, to me is always interesting because for so long businesses, some businesses, and especially some big businesses, were very um, dismissive, if not completely denying climate change because of the fear of the impacts, I would guess, on their, their businesses and their profitability. 
But as, as you highlight in the film, there is an entire universe of young champions of, of climate change action who are also looking at building businesses around it. Yeah, and I think like the researchers, I mean, some of them have science backgrounds. Some of them are coming into these businesses as, as the business people and partnering with those who have science backgrounds. Um, and I think, you know, it is, it's something, a phenomenon that like Jen was saying, you know, as people grow up and they connect climate change uh, to social justice issues and they connect it to the lives that they live and that their families and friends live, they're just compelled to find ways to try to contribute. And I think, you know, most of us try to find ways to contribute uh, towards this change. And so if you feel like business is the place where the levers of power um, and change are, then inserting yourself there, like someone like Apoorv, who very much is like an entrepreneur in the film from um, from uh, Carbon Upcycling Technologies, who's competing in the Carbon X Prize. You know, there's a whole bunch of uh, companies, startups, basically, that are competing to see if they can turn carbon dioxide into products and, and ways of offsetting carbon dioxide emissions. And, you know, big business and big industries are, are looking at this. You know, Microsoft and others, Amazon and others are making sometimes controversial and sometimes, you know, very concrete, um, you know, commitments to being net zero. And so I think, you know, there is a lot of opportunity and just, you know, as, as a twist on that, I think one of the things we tried to do in this film was look at real serious efforts and technologies where the science is maturing, um, but also, you know, startups. And it's really important as we look to the future and all this interest is generated around these solutions that we look very carefully and scientifically at which ones um, are real and which ones will have a meaningful impact because it is kind of the wild west out there right now. Um, and I think all of us are very eager to find hope and optimism and solutions. And so it's super important that we look really critically at each technology and how they fit together um, without getting sort of like too excited about any one. Yeah, being, being skeptical and open-minded at the same time is uh, a great gift to have when you're examining options for the future. You know, we're, we're at the beginning stages of, of a pandemic, which is causing uh, folks to re-examine and think about everything that we do in the way that we did it. I've often thought of myself as a, a low a low carbon footprint sort of person. I've, I've been lucky enough to be able to live close to where I, I work and I don't overdrive. But, you know, I'm now seeing that where I used to take a tank of gas a week, I'm now just using a tank a month and um, really examining how the whether it's urgent or not for me to leave the house and really trying to do trips all at once instead of little trips here and there. And I'm wondering if just in general, you see uh, one of the silver linings from this horrific pandemic might be people really examining um, how their carbon footprint, how their impact uh, may be negatively hurting the planet and looking at this as an opportunity to change when we get on the other side of, of the pandemic? Any, any one of you? I, I actually don't. I think um, people are realizing that they can get a lot done without traveling and that will be good. Um, and we've definitely seen um, a major decrease in emissions uh, uh, over the past six months, but um, a lot of academics are saying that as we come out, that will swing the other way. Um, and uh, a lot of, um, you know, philanthropy, in a lot of ways, it's, uh, the pandemic has been a distraction from, from investing in climate solutions. Um, and I think it's really important, and this goes back to what, what you and Ben were just talking about with businesses, it's really important for people to realize, um, yes, they need to take some personal responsibility and do what they can. Um, and they, they um, hopefully can see how much they can accomplish with a lower greenhouse footprint. But also at the same time, it's important um, to realize that um, solving climate doesn't have to be all about sacrifice. You could actually get rich with a business that helps the problem. And I think that's an important realization because uh, it is um, not inspiring to um, a lot of people if it feels like the only way to solve climate is, you know, go live in a mud hut, um, which, which, which really isn't the case. So I, I guess I wanna adjust my, the, the beginning of my answer a little bit. 
I think there are ways in which the pandemic has shown people things, but also it's not like you have to live in a pandemic your whole life in order to fix climate. I think that's a dangerous, a dangerous message to, to um, convey. So Kayla, yeah. do, you think, do you think we can cool the planet? Um, I have no doubt we have the science and technical capacity to cool the planet. Um, I think the ways we know how to do it um, easily are the most dangerous, both um, uh, and and uh, and there are a lot of social implications for how we do it. Um, there is room for some more technical uh, innovation, but I think um, I, I think in a lot of uh, ways it's it's it it's moving into the realm, the, the social realm of how of, of if if we can out of the scientific realm. Ben, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, yes, I think I, I cool the planet. We can certainly bend the curve of the warming. Um, and that's the first thing. And it's just important to remember through all of this, that like none of this matters unless we decarbonize our economy. Um, there's, you know, th these technologies are meant not to address all of the carbon that we're putting up there. They're only meant to address the, the pieces of the economy, like agriculture that we can't easily eliminate. So there's, that's my sort of caveat to that, that answer. Um, but I do think that, you know, whether it's these technologies or others, we have the capacity uh, with, within, you know, the next 50 years to bend the curve. And it's also important and, and to cool the planet. I think it is important to recognize that the IPCC, which is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in their projections where they talk about, um, you know, 2100 and the temperature projections, the scenarios that they're talking about have built into them already a certain amount of negative emissions. And so that means that they're not just taking the um, position that we have to just simply cut CO2 emissions to reach our goals. And, and I think it's important to, to recognize that because it means that we are already kind of over this threshold. Um, and some of these ideas are going to become important if our goal is to rein in temperature. And Jen, I'll, I'll finish with you. Do, you. do you think we can successfully cool the planet? Yeah, I, I'm really echoing uh, what both Ben and, and Caitlin are saying in that I think there is no doubt that we have the capacity. Um, and, I, and I do think it is um, the dilemmas have moved into the social realm because, of course, there are trade-offs and costs and winners and losers. And um, these solutions don't exist in a vacuum. Um, and they have not only uh, you know, ecosystem impacts, but also socioeconomic impacts um, that can be uneven. And so I think when we're looking at a contributor that unfortunately didn't make it into the cut, but she said this really intriguing thing that has stuck with me, which is that, and she's a younger scientist and her approach is we need to stop this is very much echoing what Caitlin was pointing out, and it's a really important point about not overwhelming people with a defeatist notion that it has to be, you have to live in a mud hut or you're ruining your planet. She said, we have, we really have to be looking at this as a, an economy, not of scarcity, but abundance. And how can we, how can we look at CO2 as, as something that we can do something with in addition to something we can reduce? And I think that kind of thinking is going to be absolutely necessary at the same time that we have to be, as you say, Sue, like very skeptical because greenwashing is is going to be, it already is a real thing and it's gonna be more of a real thing as the demand for quick, fast solutions to get the temperature down rises and becomes more of a, a public outcry. Well, it's a tremendous film and I can't urge folks enough to watch it. Caitlin, where can people watch it? On Nova on PBS, Wednesday, at uh, nine, check your local listings if you're not in the Boston area. On the Great. 20th. Thank you so much. Great to see the three of you. Good luck. Stay safe. I appreciate the work that you're doing. And thanks for joining us. And thanks for watching on Facebook and YouTube. Next week, we're actually going to try and have a little election fun. That's right, fun with the election. Antiques Roadshow will be here with their election collection. And I guarantee you'll have more fun than anything else that's happening during this election season if you tune in next week. I'm Sue O'Connell. Thanks for watching. I'll see you then.